great. Um, thank you so much for being with us today um, to do the introduction to Asperger Autism. This is an introduction, so we're going to cover, I've picked a few things to cover. Um, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about um, some resources and other ways to get other questions answered, to get more information if you feel like you need more after this. But we're, I'm also going to be able to take questions. So. Um, if there's things that you still want to learn more about and we, um, and we have time at the end, um, we can take questions about things that aren't a part of the webinar. And if you have questions about whatever I'm talking about, like Joanne said, please go ahead and chime in. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of information about AANE. This is our mission statement. And um, just let you know that we work with people um, all throughout the lifespan. So not just um, children and teens, but we have programs and services for adults and their families. Um, I'm going to start off with di diagnosis according to DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Number 5. Um, as probably a lot of you know, the term Asperger's Syndrome doesn't really appear in this version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the manual that psychiatry uses for diagnosis. Um, it got folded into what is called the Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, the criteria is just an important thing to go over because it's probably what brought a lot of you here. This is the first uh, half of it. Um, and these are the deficits in social communication. This does not mean having a language problem per se. It means having a social language or pragmatic language problem. Um, difficulty um, with uh, conversation, um, sharing of emotion, sharing of interests, dif difficulty with nonverbal communication behaviors. Most of communication is nonverbal. Um, it's not the words themselves, it's the tone of voice and body language and facial expressions. And if people don't have the nonverbal um, cues, then it's really easy to be confused about what's being said. And um, then also really, uh, deficits in um, relationships with peers. As you can see, um, everything begins with the word deficits. And this is um, what you sometimes hear is the medical model. Um, after this, I will um, we'll finish up with the DSM model, and I'll show you uh, what our model is here at AA and &E. Um, this is the second half, and these are the um, restrictive and repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. Um, and this is one of the things that's also considered very um, cardinal and important in making this diagnosis. Um, and uh, one of the things I'll talk about a lot later is this: the third one on the list, highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. Um, for example, strong attachment to or preoccupation with unusual objects, excess, excessively circumscribed or perseverative interests. Um, special interest is, is a big part of this world, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is how we look at this condition here at AA and &E. And as you see, it's a little bit of a different model. This is one half of our model. This is the challenge half. And I'm going to go through some of the, um, the words that you see on the page here because for many people they might be gibberish, they might, this might be the first time you've heard them, or maybe you've heard them before and you haven't been exactly certain um, about what it means. Um, you have to, we put the task in the middle, so you have to realize that all of these different challenges um, play a role in, in any child's ability to do complete any task. Um, and to think of um, all of these things as underdeveloped skills, um, it's a different kind of way of thinking about a child's behavior. Um, is that not that the behavior is purposeful, not that it's they're trying to drive you crazy, not that they're trying to be evasive, but that um, they have their skill in the area is not fully developed. Um, so um, the the bottom row, the 
the rectangles that you see are um, sensory regulation, regulation of emotions and anxiety, and regulation of, of attention and impulses. Um, regulation of emotions and anxiety, they probably could be two separate things. Regulation of emotions are these kids whose emotions um, seem to go from zero to 100 in a split second. Um, anxiety, um, so a lot of these kids, you know, they see everything as a catastrophe and they have um, a lot of trouble tolerating frustration. Difficulty with maintaining attention and impulse control is kind of just what it sounds like. Um, they can't follow through on anything. Um, they, um, you know, if they want to do something or they want to say something, they will go ahead and do it. These are people who are, um, you know, often interrupting others when they talk. Um, and they can't com control their impulses. They want it. They they um, they want to do it. They do it. Um, kids who are like that, you ask them afterwards, "Why did you do that? Why did you jump off of that thing, knowing that it wasn't such a good idea?" And they'll say, "I don't know. Um, it was just an impulse. They felt like doing it, and they did it immediately. They didn't have the the skill to um, sit back and think, hmm, is this a good idea?'" Um, Remember, it's very important to remember in very young children, some of these things are, are very typical. In what, and what I mean by that is that you will see them in all young children um, to some extent. Um, but, there are, but there are ways in which um, with children with Asperger's or an autism spectrum diagnosis, um, that they are more extreme, or they um, they last longer, or that the, the kids don't develop the skills in sort of a naturalistic way that they have to be taught them explicitly. Um, sensory regulation, a lot of people probably may have heard about things like sensory processing um, or a sensory profile. Um, People are usually, um, you know, are either hypersensitive or hyposensitive. So the hypersensitive kids are the ones who, like, you know, can't stand the feeling of the sand on the beach. They might have a hard time getting into a bath or a shower because the temperature temperature change is very uncomfortable. They're um, they're the ones who will like clamp their hands over their ears when there's an, a noise that feels that seems particularly loud to them. And um, loud noises that might be irritating to some people are actually painful to them. Um, or they are um, the kids who are hyposensitive. So um, they're the kids who get out of the, the ocean and they're all wet and they roll around in the sand and they love the feeling of the sand on their bodies and it's everywhere in every crevice and you know every part of the bathing suit. Um, and they they have um, a need, they're, we call them sensory seekers. They, they like, there's a lot of things they like to touch, sometimes they like to lick things um, and they're always looking for that input. They're the kids who um, might be more likely to need to to enjoy like pressure. They're going to um, they would use a weighted blanket or something like that. Um, the other challenges I want to talk about a little bit more. They overlap with each other. The ones a lot of the ones in the um, in the ovals um, around the side and give some examples of them. So here is a first first one. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about theory of mind, hidden curriculum, and central coherence. So theory of mind is um, a kind of perspective taking. It's the, the idea that you can put yourself into another person's shoes and kind of understand what it is they want or they think. Um, it's, an, you know, it's a skill that develops more as we get older. Um, then um, hidden curriculum. Hidden curriculum is all of the um, of the information that um, all the rules of society that are never explicitly written down, which is why they're considered hidden, um, but that we somehow know that we're supposed to do them a certain way. And um, the good a good example is if you guys had all come in today to hear this talk. Um, you probably you would have come into our um, training room and the PowerPoint would have been set up facing the wall and there would have been lots of seats and 
in front of the room there would have been a table and the ch there would be a chair next to the table and I would have walked in and none of you would be sitting in that chair in front of the room. Um, why? It, there was no sign on the chair that said don't sit here. You were no um, from experience and um, you know, probably from being in classrooms for many years, that that was the speaker's seat or kind of like the teacher's seat, and you don't sit in there. But there's, it's never written down. Those are, that's an example of a hidden curriculum, um, a piece of hidden curriculum. Another one is um, sort of knowing what um, is cool to wear and not cool to wear when you're in middle school or in high school. Um, that's another hidden curriculum example. No one usually says, oh, we've all decided we're shopping at Abercrombie and Fitch now, but kids pick that up. Um, and our kids tend not to. Central coherence is the notion of um, seeing the for you know, being able to see the forest and not being lost in the details of the trees. So that when someone asks you about something, um, you're able to, you know, ask you, you see this a lot with kids when they see a movie or read a book and you say, can you tell me what it was about? And they don't give you sort of the outline of the story. You get a lot of details that go off in a lot of tangents or they tell you one little part of the story or they tell you the second act without telling you the first act. Um, and that's, those are part of central coherence and theory of mind. So this is an example. This is a picture of um, Tim Page when he was a little boy. Tim Page grew up to be the music critic for the Washington Post and he wrote a really terrific book called um, Parallel Play. Um, he was someone who grew up with Asperger's but it was not diagnosed. And this is a good example of theory of mind, hidden curriculum, and central coherence. He, um, he was in second grade and the the assignment was to write about their field trip to Boston. He was living in Connecticut at the time. He recounts his essay and the fact that he got a very bad grade on it and got in big trouble for it. And I'm going to read it to you. Um, this is his essay on the field trip to Boston. Well, we went to Boston, Massachusetts through the town of Warrenville, Connecticut on Route 44A. It was very pretty and there was a church that reminded me of pictures in, of Russia from our book that is published by Time Life. We arrived in Boston at 9.17. At 11, we went on a big tour of Boston on Gray Line 43, made by the Superior Bus Company, like School Bus 6, which goes down Hunting Lodge Road, where Maria lives, and then onto Separist Road, and then to South Eagleville before it comes to our school. We saw lots of things at the Boston Massacre site. The tour ended at 1.05. Before I knew it, we were going home. We went through Warrenville again, but it was too dark to see much. A few days later, it was Easter. We got a cuckoo clock. Now, this is a case of a kid who was doing the best that he could and was following the directions as he understood them. Um, as you can see, um, he failed to hit the marks of what the teacher wanted. Um, he, didn't, he couldn't put himself in the teacher's shoes to understand what the teacher means when she says, write about the field trip to Boston. He wrote about the things that were important to him. He didn't have the hidden curriculum of when a teacher talks about, says, write about the field trip to Boston. They want to know um, about the educational things, not, you know, how you had so much fun sitting next to Sally on the bus. And, and you can also see the issue of central coherence. Um, he gives you a lot of details. He gives you the details, again, that he saw, that he remembered, and that were important to him, but um, there's no sort of big picture about what it was like going to Boston. Here's an example of um, when theory of mind and hidden curriculum don't work to um, present as problems. These things come together, and they make difficulties in context. And when the context isn't provided by the adult in question, then you end up with difficulty. So here's, a, here's another example. A young boy goes to the pediatrician with his mother and he has a checkup. At the end of the checkup, the doctor turns to the young boy and says, do you have any questions for me? This is a young boy with Asperger's. The kid thinks about it um, and he says, yes, how are you doing? The doctor says, I'm doing very well, how are you? 
do you have any other questions for me? The young boy thinks about it for a while and he says, yes, I haven't seen you in a while. What have you been doing? The doctor um, is pa very patient and he goes along and he tells the boy about his trip to Africa and the animals he saw and the safari he went on. Um, and then he turns to the mother and gives her a pleading look, which she understands and turns to the boy and she says, I think the doctor wants to know if you have any questions about your body or about growing up. Um, the boy has looks completely appalled by the notion of such thing, um, is completely confused and says, no, of course not. Um, so that's an example of theory of mind and, and hidden curriculum failures. What could the doctor have done differently? Well, he could have been, had he known who he was talking to and known what that meant, he could have cre created the context for the question. Um, he expected the child to understand the context, which is after you have a physical, if someone asks you if you have any questions, they're asking you, do you have any questions about the physical itself or anything related to it? Um, clearly that context didn't exist with that little boy in question. Executive function um, is another bubble on that chart. Executive function is the ability to plan, organize, and manage complex tasks. It allows us to develop and apply problem-solving skills as circumstances call for them. So this is a kid who's disorganized. He's, he's walking around and it, he seems to be like, um, it's like Pigpen from the Peanuts who has a cloud of dust that follows him everywhere, but this boy has a cloud of stuff that follows him everywhere. You know, books, school supplies, sports supplies, um, sometimes toys. Some of you might be thinking about um, your child or the child you're here in support of um, and thinking, yeah, that sounds like them. Here are some questions that talk about the specifics of what is executive functioning. So, um, executive functioning is, of course, people talk about organization, uh, so keeping track of possessions. Um, one of it is time management is one of the things. So a lot of our kids with executive function difficulties don't seem to have more than one speed at, at which they operate, which is to say that if they need to hurry up, they can't, and that they actually get very overwhelmed and more disorganized if you ask them to hurry up. They typically have a hard time starting with something, um, initiation, they, um, are often kids who, when they are diagnosed, will have um, poor scores. Working memory is one of the areas of the IQ test. Their working memory is often quite compromised. Um, and they're the ones who um, seem to be the last to know what's going on, which is to say the teacher says, OK, everyone, get out your stuff for English and all the kids are busy taking out their writing notebooks and their pencils and their, um, the book they're reading and the, this kid is just sitting there having no idea what's going on. Um, I do have at the, at the end of this an article specifically about executive function issues in, in students with Asperger's and autism and um, that gives some strategies, but we can also talk about strategies if people have questions about that. Another one of the bubble was self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is the action of representing oneself or one's views or interests. And as students get older, um, usually by middle school, certainly by high school, um, if they have an IEP, self-advocacy is a goal on the IEP. Um, self-advocacy is incredibly important um, for people whose needs might be different than the majority of people. So um, the example that's often given is that some people on this, um, with ASD or Asperger's have sensitivity to certain kinds of lights and um, have a really hard time with fake lighting that is you know, very um, prominent in like office settings and would do better with natural light. So um, an example of self-advocacy is saying, you know, I need to sit by the window. Is that something that can be arranged for me? 
Um, Self-advocacy is a skill that doesn't, you can't teach it quickly. It needs to be developed over time. And it needs to be preceded by self-knowledge, which means you can't um, represent your own interests if you don't know what they are. You need to know what you need to succeed. And the step that precedes that is disclosure. And, disclo and that's why disclosure is very important. And we'll be talking more about disclosure a little later on. Flexible thinking is another, um, another thing that's very difficult for this population. Remember what the DSM, the DSM talked about. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. So examples are extreme distress at small changes, um, difficulties with transition, rigid thinking patterns, greeting rituals, need to take the exact same route or eat the same foods every day. So it's, it's a kind of rigidity in thinking. Um, a good example of this um, comes from a lot of uh, young girls um, who, and, and adult women who report that they have this pattern of young girls. You have the young girl who's playing with the dollhouse. She sets up all the furniture and all the character, all the dolls, the way she specifically wants them. And um, she might even have a script that she takes them through. Often it would be something that she's read or seen, um, you know, in a book or in a TV show or in a movie. Now, this looks like this can look like um, pretend, regular pretend play, but she doesn't want it varied. And it means that if someone comes in and tries to have a doll say something else or move something in a different way, she, it can become very, very distressing. So we've talked, I'm gonna pause here and see if anyone has questions about the, the things that we've talked about. Give you guys a, a question, a second or two. It's okay. Um, we don't have any questions okay. yet. Okay, so I'm going to move on to strengths, and I'm going to ask everyone to think of the child or children you are here to learn more about. And um, are there what are there what are some of their strengths? What are they good at? What are the things you like or love about them? And if people want to chime in with something, I think that would be great. People want to chat in. Oh, we have we have one question that just came in before you move great. on. It's okay. um, is flexible thinking something that can be worked on and overcome? It can be. It's one of those things that um, that happens over time. Um, that usually what happens is that um, one of the best strategies for dealing with our kids, especially the kids who have so much trouble with change um, and unpredictability, is we use something called previewing. So very often, kids who are on the spectrum, they'll be the kid who walks into the classroom first thing in the morning, and you know, and you can ask the teacher this or um, or sometimes observe it yourself, and they're going to go right up to the schedule and they're going to look at it. They want to know when everything's going to happen. Um, so what you do um, once you know the, the kid is sort of secure with that is you can build in some uncertainty and teach them how to make plans for what you do when things ha don't go the way you were planning on them going. So here's a good example. There is a new video game that your child really wants and um, you don't want to go to the store and have them um, have a meltdown if it's sold out. So you can handle that a, a, a number of ways. You can say to them, um, we can go to the store and it's possible that the video game will be sold out. It's, it's, it's a good and we can also, you can also have them call or search the internet to see if it's in stock, and that is, that's a good way to deal with this. Um, but it may very well not have occurred to this, to this kid that something they want can be sold out. And um, having that in, you know, having that warning ahead of time so that they're prepared for it. Um, 
the, there's the disappointment of it not being there, but there's also the, the surprise about things not going the way they planned, which is why, you know, you have um, meltdowns in stores when the toy you want is not there. Okay. Um, we do have um, a couple of people have typed in adjectives for you in oh, terms great. of strengths. Those are thirst for knowledge, enthusiasm, um, and reliability, honesty, conscientiousness, and math skills. Okay, you guys are great. That's terrific. So yes, now remember when we looked at the DSM, it was all about deficit, 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 deficit. And I've just talked to you about what we call challenges. Um, here's pos some possible strengths. And as you can see, um, a lot of the things that you um, just mentioned are, are on, on our strengths chart as well. Um, and you guys even picked out some ones that, that aren't there. Um, so detail orientation, for example, is a very common thing. It's that not seeing the forest for the trees. Think about Tim Page's essay that his teacher hated when he was in second grade. And the fact that he grew up to be a music critic. His um, detail orientation can be a strength in the right setting. Um, so that is, that is a, a possibility. Um, our kids have a lot of strengths, and it's really important that we do things that nurture their strengths. Um, and also, they may not be aware of their strengths. That's one thing that when you're, your social connectedness, when, you're, when you're, you're not observing the things that go on around you so well, you may not be aware of the differences that, between you and others, especially our younger kids, our elementary school age kids. So it may not be until fourth or fifth grade, sometimes even later, that a kid is aware of their differences. And they may not be aware of their strengths, especially if their strengths are, um, are academic or, um, or, you know, harder to see. Um, so a kid who is, you know, in, in schools now, there's, there's very obvious competition. Um, you know, kids can tell, like if they play a sport or they, or they are in P class, it's very easy to see who's really good at sports and who's not. And schools like to sort of downplay the academic differences often in elementary school. And there's, there's good reasons for that. So sometimes our students are not aware of the fact that, that everyone doesn't have a memory like theirs, for example, or everyone can't, you know, look at the Waldo thing and find Waldo in, in you know, three seconds because they're so detail-oriented and have such great visual strengths. Um, they may not be aware of that. Um, the intense focus, which I think very often is the bane of a parent's existence because um, over and over again parents say the same thing, I'm calling them, I'm calling them, I'm calling them down for dinner, I'm trying to get their attention, they're not paying any attention to me. Um, they, um, that's, that's frustrating. But being able to focus intensely on a task um, can really be beneficial um, and not being distracted by sort of the desire to socialize, which I don't know about the rest of you, but I know for me is a big, um, is a big problem sometimes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about special interests um, because we have them down um, as a strength, which they can be, and the, DSA, the DSM also has them as a like a symptom, um, which they are, they are both. But I want to talk to you about special interests because special interests are something that parents come in and talk about all the time. Now, um, my pictures are of the kinds of things that are um, common special interests in our world. So some of them, as you can, can see, are quite, um, are quite in, in some ways unremarkable. Um, so Lots of people, lots of kids like Pokemon. That is um, the man in the picture with Pikachu and um, all the other creatures is the inventor of Pokemon who himself has Asperger's syndrome. 
Um, lots of people like Broadway musicals. Um, and uh, you, Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, lots of little kids like Thomas the Tank Engine. If we go back to the DSM, we're talking about, remember, we're talking about fixated interests that are abnormal. It's a judgmental word. It's not my word. It's the DSM's word. Abnormal in intensity or focus. So it means that they, they can be very, very common um, kinds of interests. And the thing is, is if the focus is so great that the kid, the kid truly doesn't or can't talk about or think about much else. Um, and then there are the interests that are, um, are less typical. You see I have a line of batteries there. Batteries, um, vacuum cleaners, those are less typical interests. You find fewer kids who are interested in them. Um, and so if you go to your pediatrician and you say, my seven-year-old son is obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine. He, you know, it's driving me crazy. He watches it all the time. We have every single train. Um, that might not raise alarm bells in, in your average pediatrician. If you go in and you say, my son is obsessed with batteries and he wants to collect every single kind of battery, um, that, that might do it. Um, however, it's, it's really the same, the same kind of thing. Um, some other common special interests that I have on here are, you see I have the, the MBTA map, that's the, um, the subway and um, commuter rail here in, Bo in the Boston area. Um, so the interest in, in subways is very common, and um, the sinking ship there is the Titanic, and that's also a very common interest. Other ones are like the President's, um, maps and geography, um, flags, um, and then, you know, some that are just, you know, again, they seem really unremarkable on the surface. Um, they're really, you know, some people, some kids, many kids are really, really into Minecraft. Well, that, you know, is not you know, is not that uncommon in um, any general group of, of younger younger children or even, you know, teenagers. Um, so about special interests, it can be really hard to live with someone else's special interests. I've had parents say, you know, if I have to, that they're, you know, they don't want to hear anything more about Pokemon or the Titanic. Um, anything can be a special interest. And that includes video games. And um, parents, um, almost every, you know, parents hating video games seems to be like um, an obsession among parents, especially of of, of tweens and teens, um, whether their kids have a diagnosis or not. Um, but video games are are a legitimate special interest, and and you know they're here to stay. I think we're going to have to live with them. Um, there's a lot of talk about special interests being a basis for employment skills, and, and that can ha and does happen. Um, a good example of that, probably the most notable example of that, is, is Temple Grandin, who is a woman um, on the autism spectrum who's, um, who's, who credits um, her autism and her, her intense interest in animals with her success, um, and she's a professor of animal husbandry. Um, in Colorado, Spe but special interests can do more than employment than build employment skills. They also um, are ways of of connecting people, and ways of helping pe helping kids understand. So you can, um, if your child, let's say, is interested in watching an episode of something over and over and over again. Um, if you watch it with them, you may be able to use it as a way of talking about some of the things they're struggling with, like if they're struggling with friendships, if they're struggling with emotions, if they're struggling with understanding people around them. Um, people theorize that kids with um, kids on the spectrum like Thomas the Dang Engine so much because the trains have such expressive faces. It's really easy to understand. Um, what they're thinking. The other thing is that 
there are some special interests that are just common out there in the world, like I said. Um, lots of people play Pokemon. Um, a colleague of mine used to say, if you have a kid in New England who's obsessed with the Boston Red Sox, they can have a conversation with a lot of people. It gives them a way um, of connecting. Um, the other thing is that, you know, passions um, make people interesting. If you've ever encountered people who, uh, and there are not many of them, who just are never excited about anything, there's nothing that really thrills them, um, they're kind of boring. And when you meet people who are very passionate about their, um, their work or their hobbies, there's, there's an excitement about them that's really, um, that's really quite wonderful. And um, but one of the biggest things that, that is important to know about special interest in kids on the spectrum is that they are a way of managing anxiety. When someone is pursuing their special interests, and we have reports of this from kids, from teens, and from adults, that at that moment they feel very calm. Um, a lot, they, they're very focused on it. They're not thinking about the things that they're worried about or that they're anxious about. And um, they really are, are a coping mechanism. And so in the past, um, there's been this focus on having parents sort of extinguish special interests. And at this point, um, the tide has kind of shifted and the thinking now is that you, um, you know, that special interests are something that you know we, we learn to live with and we learn to utilize. And one of the things that does have to be taught with a special interest is um, the understanding of the difference between someone who really, your friend who might love to hear about Minecraft and want your peer at school who wants to talk to you about Minecraft and your parents who may really not be very interested at all in Minecraft. Um, and I think it's really, sometimes we, we listen to our kids um, and feign interest really well and they don't understand, they, they go around not understanding um, that people can, can be interested in different things. Um, and because of their difficulties with social pragmatics, they're not going to take the subtle hints um, that, you know, we need, they need to be taught to understand the subtle hints. Like if someone um, keeps changing the subject, that means they might not be interested in what you're talking about. And um, to be able to say to them, um, okay, it's, you know, it's, it's been too long. Um, you've been talking about this for too long. And, you know, there's some adults in our community who even have said, um, that they tell people, they tell their, their friends that a, colleagues and acquaintances and significant others. If I'm talking too much about something, please stop me and let me know because I, I won't know on my own and, um, and I, I won't be offended if you tell me. Now that's a really, really good example of, um, of self-advocacy. So I told you we would talk a little bit about, well before I go on, does anyone have any, in, any questions about special interests? Um, I told you we talk a little bit about disclosure, and I'm going to play a video um, for you about disclosure. This is uh, oh, go ahead, Joanne. Before you do that, we do have one question about special interest, okay. and that is, I wonder if you've ever seen a child with an imaginary special interest, uh, meaning an imaginary friend that they always talk about. Oh, definitely. Um, and some kids have, you know, as their special interest, they have, you know, very good imaginations and they have um, sometimes even places that they've made up and talk about all the time. Okay. And um, is it possible that reading could be a special interest? Absolutely. And again, that's another, you know, to, you know, sometimes it's reading nonfiction and so we have the kid you know our kids like there are a lot of kids who like to um, just sort of gather facts one of the um, psychiatrists in our community says you know these kids you shake them and facts fall out um, and then there are a lot of kids who like fiction reading very often they um, 
it's kind of a genre fiction, so they might read a lot of the same kind of fiction. Um, of course, uh, you know, lots of people do that. There are people who are mystery buffs, people who like science fiction, people who like fantasy. And um, the thing, you know, it can be helpful to, um, you know, to, to read some of the things your child is reading um, as a way of connecting with them and talking about um, certain issues with them. Um, but yeah, reading is definitely one. I mean, one of the special interests that I think is still very common with that I didn't put a picture of um, is Harry Potter. Special interest in our community. I know it is in my family. Yeah, <laughs> it's going through my house right now too. Um, you know, it's one of, the, in my opinion, it's one of the better ones. There definitely have been ones that I thought, oh, I can't wait for this to end, and there've been. There have been, I've lived through a lot of special interests. So, um, as you know, if you talk to, I know, I know that um, our audience is some parents and some, um, you know, other people, professionals and educators and such. Um, but if you talk to any parents about the special interests, um, they all have um, lots and lots to tell you about. So, this is Noah, and he he is the son of. Brenda, who is our associate director, and she um, interviewed him about disclosure. Um, he is a young adult now in college, and we're going to listen a little bit uh, to Noah talk about disclosure. So Noah, I'm hoping you can tell other parents why you think it's important for them to talk to their kids about their diagnosis. Well, I mean, it's the central part of who they are, they have autism, they have uh, Asperger's, they have ADD, it affects their brain, it affects how they think, it affects how they work, it affects how they feel, it affects really everything about their lives. And uh, really, simply, it's just they need, they, they need to know that. They need to know that you know there's a reason they're having trouble with things they're having trouble. It's not just because they're not good at them. It's not because, you know, they just can't do it. It's not because they're not trying hard enough. They need to know that any issues they have aren't entirely their fault. I mean, I know that, and I still occasionally get some look through the very already complex about the basic stuff I can't do. Uh, it's got to it's be 10 times worse for someone who just doesn't understand why they can't, you know, tie their shoes right. Mm -hmm. Or have issues like that, or they can't write. They, they need to know why they but it was part of who they are and you deserve they deserve to know that about themselves. And how do you think knowing that you have Asperger's has helped you? Uh, it's allowed me to see uh, how it's affected me, what my faults are, it's allowed me to work on what I know are my weaknesses because of it. Um, it's allowed me to understand why I do what I do and uh, realize that what I do isn't always my fault and taught me how I can prepare to uh, be you know, a better person, come across better conversation, explain myself to people better, it's helped me get more support, it's helped me become far more self-aware, and it's helped me feel, feel better about myself. So really there's no reason to not tell your kid. That's wonderful, Noah. Thank you. I think that'll help parents. Okay, so um, let's go back to my original PowerPoint. So that's talking about Asperger's autism. So um, dis, you know, parents often, if they're if they're um, close to the uh, diagnosis. Um, one of the questions they ask is, when should we tell our child? How should we tell our child? One of the links that I've included in this in this PowerPoint is um, a, work, a, a talk on disclosing to your child. Um, the purpose of so Noah um, does a really good job, I think, of, of verbalizing the purpose of disclosure to the child, which is um, is to increase their self knowledge and self 
you know, and understanding and hopefully toward the goal of increasing their self-acceptance and also toward the goal of increasing their self-advocacy. Um, you know, Noah says that it helps him explain himself to people, it helps him get the supports he needs. And um, though, so that's, a, that's something that we, we want our kids, a skill we want them to develop um, as part of their independence skills as they, you know, as they get older. Um, uh, and because once they, you know, become adults, they they need to to be able to advocate for themselves. Younger children, their parents are are usually their primary advocates. Um, disclosure, you know, is is a really big issue because it it happens in many ways. Um, it's not just you know. Parents, we think a lot about parents disclosing the diagnosis to their children, but there's also the issue of disclosing the diagnosis to the rest of the world and how that works. Um, one of my colleagues talks a lot about something called strategic partial disclosure, and I will say that um, it's um, Sometimes, you know, parents often ask, do I, you know, should I say the diagnosis? I'm worried about scaring people or something. And um, the information that you give needs to serve the, the purpose of making it easier for your child to do whatever it is you want them to do and in a certain setting. Um, so sometimes the word is you know Asperger's or autism or social communication disorder or PDD or whatever it is is not the most helpful thing. The most helpful thing is what behaviors or um, reactions your child might have, why they have them, and what is a good way to deal with them. Um, and you know if people have more questions about disclosure. We can talk about it now, we can talk about it later, because um, it's a big issue. And um, parents not only talk, come in with questions about disclosing to their, to their child, but they have questions about disclosing to the child's siblings, to, um, to the extended family, to the school, um, and other, other places in the community that your child might go. So Erica, we do have a couple of questions coming in about disclosure. Okay. okay. One, of, one of them is when should we tell our child and how strong should we be with them if they don't really think they have Asperger's? Um, so normally, you know, it, it depends on when you get the diagnosis. So I mean, usually the ideal time people talk about is is really before the kid is in middle school. Late elementary school seems to be the ideal time um, because that's the time when kids are usually becoming more self-aware um, and, and noticing things um, are, are a little different about them um, versus their peers. And I think once, once the kid has some self-awareness, that's when you disclose. But even before you make a disclosure, about a diagnosis, you can talk a little bit about difference. Um, introduce the concept of difference. Um, there are lots of ways to do it. You can do it through books. And keep pointing out that people are different from one another. And very often, people's differences are a source of strength as well as a source of challenge. So um, one of the examples that I like to give is Superman. Superman comes from another planet. And he is different from everyone else. And um, but because he is different, he has all these superpowers here on Earth. Um, he also has this weakness of, you know, kryptonite harming him, which no uh, no one else on Earth has. Um, so that shows, you know, that difference is, is not something that's shameful. And I think I think that's a message to get your kid to give your kids really early on. I mean, another good example, it, you know, there's examples all over the place if you really start to think about it this way. Um, Dumbo. Dumbo is a perfect example. Everyone, you know, he get, he's born and they start making fun of his ears, but it turns out, you know, his ears, which make him different and make people tease him, are also what um, makes it so he can fly. Um, so once, you know, I think, you know, introducing the concept of thinking differently, learning differently, things like that, 
and make you know trying it to have a comfort level with it. The reason it gets harder to to um, to disclose to kids once they're in middle school um, is and often early high school is because it's a very conformist time, and that's the time when they're really uncomfortable with the idea about being different. Um, so when you disclose to your kid, the recommendation is that you talk specifically about them, you talk about the, their strengths, which you guys were able to generate a bunch of them, and their challenges, and the things that are harder for them. And explain to them that there's a term for this, and you give the term, so it means that they're not the only one. There are lots of people who struggle with this. Very often, um, people report that they find it a relief. It's not always the case. Some kids will have denial. Um, you can, you know, there are some people who, who, have, who have kept their denial throughout their lives, and, but that's really the minority. So there are, you know, you meet adults now, I meet adults now who seem so comfortable with themselves. And I think, wow, and they, and they say, oh yeah, I was in complete, you know, I was in complete denial about having Asperger's when I was um, a teenager. So um, I think I would look at it developmentally. Um, and sometimes a kid will accept something like, oh, I, you know, I, they don't like the Asperger's or autism thing, but they can accept that they have social anxiety. Okay. Um, another, a few questions have come in. What about um, when you make the di when the diagnosis is made late, so the child is in their teenage years? How do you broach that with the child, uh, which I think you've already covered, but also with acquaintances? Um, so you definitely want, you know, if you if someone gets a diagnosis as a teenager, you definitely want to tell them, um, you know. They need they need that information for the reasons I you know I think that Noah gave, um, and then the way that you deal with it in um, in other you know with with friends or family members or whatever is um, you know it's really it's really up to you um, you know it may be I mean essentially what what you want to give people is the information that they should have. Um, so for, I'll give an example. When my son was little, when he was he was in elementary school and he was diagnosed, and I um, I told his uh, Hebrew school teacher that he had Asperger's, um, and she said okay. And the year seemed to go really well. Um, at the end of the year, we got a report card, and she mentioned that he had a rude tone, and I thought, oh my gosh, I told her that he had Asperger's, but it occurred to me that. I had not told her what that meant specifically for him and what she was going to see from him and how she should approach it. So what you really want to tell people, I mean, if you have whatever you know concern you have um, is that this is something that might happen and here are some ways to deal with it. That's, you know, that's sort of the primary information that people need to know. Okay. So we have um, so we have a number of other people calling in, um, typing in, with um, similar questions. And um, somebody has pointed out the book "All Cats Have Aspergers" as that's something that they've used with their younger children to kind of um, preface the discussion, and that has gone well. Yeah, no, I I actually know people who've used it even with middle schoolers. Um, and and have said that that's gone well. Um, we do have some books on the AANE website that that um, that are helpful for kids to read who have care that they have characters um, on the spectrum. Um, there's for older kids. There's a good book. I think it's called Aspergers and Self Esteem, and the author is Norm Legend. L-E-D-G-I-N, I think is how his name is spelled, and it's about, you know, uh, people from history who are believed to be on the spectrum. Um, and then there's a version of that for kids called um, Different Like Me, My Book of Autism Heroes, and I can't right now remember the name of the author, but that's another good example of some um, tools. And that um, also talks about different people from history 
um, who are believed to have been on the spectrum. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I wanted to give people just some information on um, how to go, how to go a little bit through daily life um, with these situations. And one of the things that we always recommend parents, teachers, um, anyone who's grandparents, aunts, uncles, anyone who's dealing with these kids work on is knowing your own triggers. So knowing what are the things that your children or your child do that really drive you crazy. Um, because we need to have our self-knowledge too and um, knowing what's going to push your buttons. Um, and so you can be especially prepared for those situations when they arise. I mean, very often we, we, not always, but often we have a sense of how our child is going to um, react to something. And um, instead of, you know, knowing it and dreading it, we can know it and prepare. Um, so here are some um, of my, um, you know, quick um, strategies for parents to use. Um, don't take it personally. So I think that's a really good thing as, as a parent, um, whether you have a young child or, um, and it's certainly when you have an adolescent or a pre-adolescent, is don't take everything they say and do personally. Um, it's not all about you. In fact, very little of it is about us. Um, sometimes it feels like our children are doing things in order to drive us crazy, and that, that's usually not their goal. Um, using written or visual communications, so things like pictures, checklists, um, the, the little face that you're seeing um, on this slide is my dog, and um, she is pretty um, important to my kids. So occasionally, um, they will get messages about things that she wants them to do, and sometimes even with pictures of her. Um, the nice thing about written or visual communications, one is that we know that a lot of our kids have difficulty with their um, working memory. So if you think, how come when I say to my kid, go upstairs and brush your teeth, they seem to go upstairs and have forgotten what I have told them to do. It's possible that they have. It's a lot easier with um, a written or visual reminder. Um, even if it's hanging in the bathroom, the reminder to brush your teeth. Um, sometimes people have pictures of how to do it if you're, um, if you're at that, that point. Um, checklists, things like that. These are, are a lot better. They, they, take us out, they, they keep us from having to say the same thing over and over again, which a lot of people don't like. I know that's one of my triggers. And they, um, they keep the tone out of it. They make it, and they make it easier for the kids to follow. Um, being concrete and explicit with directions. Um, remember, there's a problem with co communication without context. So the father of the middle school girl who was loading the dishwasher after dinner and turned to his daughter and said, there's room in the dishwasher for your dish. And she said, OK. And he said, there's room in the dishwasher for your dish. Now, he, he changed his, um, his nonverbal communication that way by changing his tone. Um, and she said, OK, thanks for telling me. She was obviously very confused. Um, the mother said, just tell her to put her dish in the dishwasher. That's what he was trying to communicate. Um, sometimes you have to be explicit with directions. and. And, and it's a surprise. Um, this morning, I, we have a, a refrigerator and freezer in our basement. And this morning, I went down to get something from it and discovered that the ice cream had been put in the refrigerator. Um, just a few days ago, um, I had, you know, my son had been helping out. And he went down and he put, you know, he put the extra milks and the extra half and half and the extra ice cream downstairs. And um, he put them in the wrong place. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was I opened the freezer and there wasn't enough room, so I just stuck the ice cream in the refrigerator, or um, I, um, 
I just put everything in the refrigerator and I didn't think about the fact that the ice cream was frozen. You know, this is a kid who's um, probably going to be taking calculus next year. I never took AP calculus. Um, and that's another reason why we're very concrete and explicit because our kids have an uneven profile and they have deficits. And sometimes we have to be more concrete and explicit than we realize. So we're going to be having a discussion about what goes in the refrigerator and what goes in the freezer. Um, and the other thing is to pick your battles. So very often when a parent gets a diagnosis, um, you get this neuropsych report, you get this evaluation, and there are like, you know, recommendations of millions and millions of things you can do. Um, and you want to start making changes right away. And usually, um, the way the change works is that the more extreme it is and drastic it is, the less likely it is to stick. So um, taking what we call baby steps, making small um, concrete change, changes um, is, is a better way to go. Um, this is um, Brenda Dater, whose son you saw, you probably recognize that's their dog, you probably recognize him from, her from the video. Um, these are some of her favorite strategies. Talk less. Um, that kind of goes along with the um, making visual or written requests. Make your, you know, um, make your requests very simple. Don't use a lot of flowery language. Um, please put your dish in the dishwasher is better than um, there's room for your dish in the dishwasher. Set appointments. Um, that can be really helpful. Uh, you your child might want to talk to you about something or you might need to do when you're not ready you might want to do something or have them do something when they're not ready um, make an appointment for a time when both of you are are able to sit down and do something wait 30 seconds so a lot of our kids have difficulty processing language um, so we ask them a question and they don't answer right away and we can't always tell what they're if they're thinking about the answer or if they're confused or what's going on because for some of our kids express when they talk the expression on their face doesn't change or it doesn't seem to match the emotion that they're having um, so waiting 30 seconds before you ask a question again or ask them if they've heard you is um, is a good way to give them that time to process um, because sometimes, and 30 seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but if you sit there and you count it and you sit in silence, it, it's, it, it's actually a lot more silence than we normally have. And um, it, would give, it will give them time to answer the question if they need to. So, this is, you can always find more information on our website. This is a, a snapshot of our, our website. We're aane.org. This is what it, it looks like. Um, here are some of the resources that I pulled aside for you guys. Um, there's two articles. One is the article on executive functioning disorder. And the other one um, is easy to implement. Um, interventions that for, for school. It's specifically written for school, but um, many of them are useful at home as well. Um, there's the video on how to disclose to your child and information on, on Brenda's book, Parenting Without Panic, which is extremely helpful and I would definitely recommend it to um, parents who have, you know, fairly recently diagnosed children or um, if they're, they're stuck. Um, a, we are going to be launching a webinar series of um, a course that we have given um, live, and uh, we call it "Raising Your Child," um, "Raising Your Child on the Autism Spectrum," and it's a three-session webinar series. I'll be doing the first one, which is on um, social connections and making friends. We're going to talk about play dates. Um, and things like that. The next two are done by um, Jean Stern, who is an educator and a behaviorist. Um, the first, the second session will be on behavior, um, and the third session is on um, how to work with the school. And 
the, the link on the bottom is the registration and um, these are the, the dates um, and the fees for it in case you want some more information that way. We also have here at AANE um, something called parent coaching um, and it's a one-on-one -on -one individualized session of problem solving um, for um, for families and it can help it's it's good for um, newly diagnosed families it's good for when you feel stuck it's good um, if you have specific issues with the school um, it's good if you um, you have that long list of um, recommended strategies and interventions figuring out which ones you really should do and which ones you, you can you can bypass and um, the strategies for parenting on the same page which is when um, and it's not something to feel embarrassed about because it's en enormously common um, when parents one parent wants to do things one way and one parent wants to do things another way and you're having a hard time being on the same page with each other so that is the end of the official um, the official talk and if you guys have any questions I'm happy to take them we have we have lots of questions for you okay which is excellent um, so I'm going to start back. Um, here's one question about um, helping a child get onto an IEP. Their son is like the little professor and is reading at a 10th grade level but is only a 7th grader and how does I get help to put him on an IEP? So um, you know, that question is, is, is a little, the answer is a little bit different based on where you live. Um, here in Massachusetts, we have a pretty strong autism IEP law, but um, that talks about the things that the um, need to be looked at in um, in, a, in a student, and it's not just about their academics; it's also about um, their other, uh, you know, their their social and emotional functioning, their sensory stuff, their organization, all the things that we've talked about, and. Um, Actually, IDEA, which is the law that mandates free, appropriate ed public education for children with disabilities, um, also is, is, has a lot of this um, same wording in it. So it's a matter of going back to the school and talking, uh, you know, and talking about what accessing because what it, what it means to what we call access the curriculum because you're accessing the curriculum. So that parent, um, schools take that to mean how they're doing academically. But they're also supposed to be accessing what's called the life of the school. So are they able to make friends? Are they, are they sitting alone at lunch? Have they joined any clubs? If it's an elementary age student, do they play with anyone at recess? Um, things like that. Because that's part of the um, that's part of the experience. Sometimes it's really beneficial to go on your, your school district's website and look at the benchmarks for your child's grade. Almost in every case there are um, social and emotional benchmarks um, where, you know, um, and to look at, to, to see if your, your child is meeting those. Very often though, in, in cases where the district is is relying on an overly rigid definition of accessing the curriculum or making effective progress, Parents have to um, hire and bring in advocates, special education advocates, um, and that's something we have a big database here at a and &E, and that's something that we can help you find. Okay. Oh, next question. So then we have a couple of questions about special regarding special interests, and they're both about um, frequency. Is it common for special interests to change, and about how frequent do they occur? Or does this so, change occur? Yeah, so when, how often, so there's, it varies across the board. There are some kids who get a new, who, you know, change, you know, constantly, um, what, you know, get a new one seemingly, you know, every other week, um, who have a few going at the same time. Um, you know, there's, you know, it's some, you know, every six months, every year. There are definitely those who, who 
you know, have have a special interest that they've had since childhood, and they they maintain it all throughout their life. Um, you know, it could be sports team, animals, something like that. Um, there's no there's no set rule about special interests. Um, it's good if you are trying to connect with a kid to know what their special interest is and have some information about it. Okay. Um, then there are a couple of questions about disclosure. So mm -hmm. one is with a young child, about seven, who accepted the diagnosis and now is coming back giving his parents uh, potential reasons of why he could have Asperger's. And um, the question is whether, is this typical for the, so, for the child to accept it and then come back and start to question, you know, why they have it? Um, you mean what, what caused it? Is that what they're asking? No, more of, you know, well, I'm very kind, so maybe that, you know, maybe I got that because of, I, because of my Asperger's. Or I'm very, um, you know, I read very well. Maybe that came from having Asperger's. Yeah. I think that, um, I think actually that's really good. I think that's a kid who's trying to make sense of themselves. And, um, you know, you can tell them that, you know, it, it, it's, it's confusing because it's, it's confusing for a young child and it's confusing um, for someone who might be concrete, but um, that you can tell them that, you know, some of the things are because of the Asperger's and some of the things are just how they are, and the Asperger's is, is one part of them. So it affects a lot of different things. Um, the important thing, you know, the thing that is actually more common is kids saying, I can't do that because I have Asperger's. Um, and that's when we want to say, no, it's hard for you to do that, and we're going to give you more time and more help to do that, but you can do it. It's just going to take you a little bit more time and more work. So we, we, don't, we, don't, want to use, we don't want it to be used as an excuse. Okay. Um, another person is asking, so you talked, um, you talked about advice on how to tell a young child about their diagnosis. Is there anything different you would add if the student is in high school? Um, you know, students, um, you, you can give them their evaluations to read. They should read their IEPs. Once they're um, around 14 or 15, they, should, they can come to their IEP meetings. It's a really good idea. Um, what you want, you know, you, as, as students get older, is you, they, you want them to have a lot of information about themselves. Um, what some parents have done is, you know, you, you, know, you, can, sit, you can sit down with the, the kid and go, go over the evaluation. Um, if, if the child, if, if the teen has a therapist or like a trusted counselor at school or something like that, it might be easier for them. They might feel more comfortable going through um, all that information with someone other than their parent. Um, our teens pull away from their parents just the way neurotypical teens do. Um, the difference is, is they often don't have a, a peer group to become enmeshed in. Um, so very often, it's really, really helpful for them to have some sort of other adult um, in their lives with whom they can, they can talk. Okay. Um, another question is about, um, this person is a teacher and says that she has a child in her class who speaks to her in a rude tone of voice, and she's wondering how to approach that. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, you can, the thing, the thing to do is to um, not, you don't want to assume that the child is doing it intentionally and is aware that they're doing it. Um, you don't want to embarrass them in front of their peers, but you want to um, pull them aside and if you want to have the help, you could have the help of like the school, school counselors, social workers, psychologists, to explain to them the difference between, you know, to, to explain to them what a rude tone is, what it sounds like, and how it makes people feel. Because that's the, that's the thing that they aren't, they probably aren't seeing. And then also show them an example, you know, and show them what a polite tone would be. And even with the, the same, you know, have the example of something they said and the way they said it, and 
show them how to say it in a different way. And then, you know, I mean, I would check, you know, if you, I would check in with the parents in, to see if this is happening at home. Because um, it's, it's best if things are done in multiple um, environments because they're, the, the, the kids are more likely to, you know, to, to, to hold on to the information if it's being reinforced in different places. And just very gentle very gentle you know that's you know that's not you know that's not the that's not a polite voice that's not the polite tone you know um, or even make a, a, a way of something that you're going to say to the kid so that you're so that you you you're telling him or him or her to say it differently but in a way that's not admonishing them like um, like can you think of a different way to say that um, but you can't just say that to them because they're not going to be able to think of a different way to say that. You need to teach them the skill, which is how to, you know, how to say something in a, in a more polite way, and then you can reinforce the skill. And um, even, you know, when, and, and also, you know, they may not even be aware of the difference. So if they are, if they do polite, you know, say things in polite tone or language to you or to any of their classmates, you can, um, you can reward it, you can reinforce it so, um, so that, that they're aware of the difference because they may not even be quite aware of the difference. Okay. Um, another question talks about down, downtime and does my child need more downtime and they're trying to figure out they they're trying to figure out if the child's trying to socially isolate themselves or if they're um, just needing to stay at home and rest um yeah the norm normally um, well everyone needs a different most people need different varying amounts of downtime um, and you know there's the sort of introvert extrovert scale people who are extroverts are really energized by being around people and they don't need a lot of downtime and then people who are introverts are re-energized by being alone and some of them need a tremendous amount of downtime um, our kids kids on the spectrum often need quite a lot of downtime kids and adults on the spectrum um, because being around other people being in school needing to listen um, all the things that they're trying to do are, are pretty exhausting. So it's good to build in time for downtime and um, also um, time for socializing as well. Um, you know, I normally, a lot of parents, and I do this in, in my house too, um, you know, and it's hard for me because I'm more of an, an extrovert than either of my children, is to just give them space when they get home. Um, they, you know, and not take it personally that they don't want to talk because they don't want to talk because they're they're kind of white. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's pretty common to give them a lot of downtime, um, and it, I think it's good to be very explicit about how much time they're going to have and what they what you know how much time they have where they can do whatever they want. Um, and in a lot of cases, kids will want to use screens, and how much time they have where they should be, um, you know, where you want them, they can have downtime, they don't have to start their homework, they don't have to do any chores, but um, if you want it to be, if you also want them to have downtime that's screen free. Um, this is more the case with younger kids um, than older kids, I would say. All right, thanks Erica. Um, the next question, mm -hmm talks about special interests and coaching and it is does AANE recommend coaches to help teens separate from special interests when they're interfering with socializing and getting out of the house? Um, that might be something for a therapist to work on. Um, you know I think it would be really important to think about the whole context like um, is the teen is it, is it that the special interest is in interfering or is the teen, you know, sometimes when people, when kids are, 
you know, one of the ways you can tell if someone is, is having difficulty, if they're maybe feeling depressed or overly anxious or struggling a lot, is that you see an increase in their special interest. Um, and they, um, they, they use it as a way of kind of hiding out from the world. Um, so I think it would be more important to find, to find out the whole story about what's going on um, and then addressing the issue of, of having balance. I wouldn't take the special interest away because remember that the special interest is, is an anxiety management tool. Okay, so the next question talks about services and insurance. And this is um, from a family who's been on a waiting list for ABA services from their local ARC. And they've been waiting about 15 months. They're wondering if this is normal and is there some place else that they could be looking for these services? Um, yeah, that seems really long, um, they, they could give us a call. Um, we do have a list of ABA services and they could look at, at other places. Um, in states, I know Massachusetts has this and it's not the only one, um, where we have an autism insurance law, um, ABA is, is usually supposed to be covered. Um, it, it's not uncommon for there to be long waits for services, but over a year for ABA seems seems really long. I would definitely um, recommend trying some other providers. Okay, um, so the next question talks about uh, sleepovers. So my child's been invited to a friend's house for a sleepover and they really want to go but I'm nervous about it. How can I make this situation successful? Um, you know, I think it depends on, you know, I think what, one of the things you have to do is kind of um, think about all the, the possible concerns you have, the outcomes you're worried about, and kind of think of strategies to address them. Um, and also make sure that the other family is, is a partner with you. So again, this would be a place where you would want to do some disclosing, um, whether it was strategic partial disclosure, um, or not, you want to be able to give the parent, you know, in question some information. Um, you want to make sure that you're available to be reached. Um, I think that, you know, I think sometimes in situations like that, we get really excited because our kids aren't invited to a lot of things and we want it to succeed so badly. I think um, it's better to think of it as something we're trying out. Um, you know, for the parents to think that way and for the kids to think that way. Like, okay, we're going to give this a try. It could be really fun. Um, and then you want to do previewing for your child. You know, what to expect when you have a sleepover. You may want to um, talk to the parent and see what, what they're planning, um, what they and the other child are planning. And that, you know, um, and express that it might be good to have some plans. Um, and, uh, you know, and definitely, you know, keep your cell phone next to your bed when you go to sleep that night um, in case you get a call to pick them up. And um, just, you know, let it, even if it doesn't succeed, the fact that your child is willing to go outside of their um, comfort zone is a really great thing. And the fact that someone invited them is a really great thing. So um, I always recommend that we celebrate everything that's good, um, even if it's very small. So we have a number of people who've typed in books that they recommend and books that they've found helpful. So at the end of this, I'll send out an email with a list of those books on it as well. Oh, that's great. Terrific. And then we have a question about in-laws and parents. And this is, my parents and or in-laws want to be helpful, but I'm not sure how. Do you have any ideas to make that work better? Um, yeah, so that's, you know, very often, well, one of the things that, that we can, you can do is you can, if they're willing, you can get them connected with us here at AANE. and &E. we, um, we have a lot of grandparent, we have a grandparent face-to-face -face group and we have some other grandparent, we have a whole section on the website for grandparents. Um, I think the thing to do is 
Well, it depends again on, on the relationship. Um, whether they're some you know, some grandparents are very involved and they're actually providing childcare and things like that, but um, there's also a um, you know just the, the grandparent role. And I think what you want to do again, if like if you have a grandparent who wants to, they want to do something, and they're going to pick something that is not going to be a success. Um, and then, like, they want to take, your, they want to take the, you know, you have a young, let's say, daughter, and they want to take them to high tea at one of the hotels downtown. And you know, this your your daughter's not going to like it. It's not going to work. It's not going to be a success. For us to get in there and to say, like, okay, I'm so happy that you want to do something with so and with, you know, with your granddaughter. Here are some things that I recommend. And then also giving them some advice, um, even written advice, um, on things that, that might occur. Again, just giving them the information they need um, and that might be helpful. The other thing is that if it's, you know, if it's something that's sort of new when you're starting out, I, I think starting out small is good. So, you know, something that's a little bit short, something that's very structured to start out with. Um, and then see how it goes. And again, you know, um, I think always sort of take the mindset that we're trying something out and we'll see how it goes. And no matter what happens, we're going to learn something. So um, switching gears a bit, the next question talks about movies. And is it typical for kids with Asperger's to have a hard time watching movies unless they're almost of a preschool age? that the film is, um, you can more or less guarantee that it has a friendly ending. Yeah, movies can be, um, can be difficult for kids and often it takes a long time to get them to um, be comfortable in the movie theater because it's loud, to understand, sometimes they have a hard time understanding what's going on because a lot of it is based on that, um, that uh, nonverbal that nonverbal information. Um, sometimes, you know, again, with the slow processing speed, it can be hard to follow the story. And so, yeah, very often <clears throat> kids will like things that are quote unquote younger for them. One of the things we want to remember about kids on the spectrum is that they are usually um, socially and emotionally younger than their chronological age. So don't, you know, sometimes as much as two thirds their chronological age. So if you have a 12 year old who likes things that an eight-year-old would like, um, don't freak out about it. Um, and that's also the reason that you will see them watching, very often they watch things over and over again and they read things over and over again. Now, young kids often like to watch things over and over again. Um, if you've lived with a young child, you know, since the age of um, videos and DVDs and, and you know, DVRs and on demand, um, we all have had that experience of watching the same, you know, um, Elmo video over and over and over again. But, you know, that is something that, that will persist. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, the, the important thing is that, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're on their own trajectory. The important thing is that they're making progress. And I know it can be hard. Um, when your child has a younger a younger interest, but it's it's really not uncommon. All right, Erica, we have time for one last question, and we're going to end on um, resources for newly diagnosed young adults. So there's a, a son who is a college freshman, and he didn't have an IEP in school, and just received his diagnosis. So. Um, can you recommend sites and books for them? Um, the place I would definitely recommend going is to our website and look under um, resources for um, young for adults and their families. And you know, there's a lot of books. There's videos, um, you know, first person videos. There's you can get to the webinars and things like that. You could also um, call um, um, our adult services program and um, ask specific questions. We have, you know, for, like I said at the beginning, we serve the whole lifespan and we have a resource database and um, call or email us regardless of the age of 
the person about whom you're calling, and um, we can give you some information and some assistance. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, we are out of time, uh, but I did want to remind everyone that a copy or a link to this video will be sent to you on Friday so you can go ahead and watch it again at your convenience and I will be sending out a list of the books uh, that have been recommended from other viewers today. So Erica thank you very much and everyone have a great day and thanks for joining us. Thank you too. Bye. Bye.